I'm Dr. Keanu Sai, and I'm a political scientist specializing in international relations and public law, with particular emphasis on the legal and political history of Hawaii. I'm also a plaintiff in a lawsuit against the Obama administration that was filed on June 1, 2010, in Federal District Court in Washington, D.C. In order to better understand the lawsuit and its profound impact today, I've produced short vignettes that cover certain sections of the complaint. This particular presentation covers the second attempt by the United States to annex the Hawaiian Islands between 1894 and 1898. After the Hawaiian Kingdom government was illegally overthrown, two executive agreements were entered into between President Cleveland of the United States and Queen Liliuokalani of the Hawaiian Kingdom in 1893. The President entered into these executive agreements under his sole constitutional authority to represent the United States in foreign relations, and neither Congress nor the courts can intervene without violating the separation of powers doctrine, which would be an encroachment upon the executive power. The first agreement, called the Liliuokalani Assignment of Executive Power, binds the U.S. President and his successors in office to administer Hawaiian law. The second agreement, called the Restoration Agreement, binds the U.S. President and his successors in office to restore the Hawaiian Kingdom government and thereafter for the monarch to grant amnesty to those who committed treason on January 17, 1893. According to Professor Quincy Wright, a leading scholar and authority in U.S. foreign relations law, he states that the president binds himself and his successors in office by executive agreements. And statements of a decision on fact or policy authorized by the president must be accepted by foreign nations as the will of the United States. It wasn't long, however, before the Congress would take active political steps to prevent the President from carrying out the 1893 executive agreements. Encroaching upon the President's sole authority to represent the United States in foreign relations did not in the least alter or change the executive agreements, which remained binding under international law as well as U.S. federal law. Rather, congressional encroachment would prevent the president from securing appropriated monies needed to send U.S. troops back to Hawaii to enforce the executive agreements. On February 7, 1894, the U.S. House of Representatives passed a resolution warning other countries to not intervene in the affairs of Hawaii. In particular, the House resolution stated that foreign intervention in the political affairs of the islands will not be regarded with indifference by the government of the United States. And on May 31, 1894, the Senate also passed a resolution to prevent the President from enforcing the executive agreements, as well as issuing another warning to other countries. The Senate resolution in particular stated that the United States ought in no wise to interfere therewith and that any intervention in the political affairs of these islands by any other government will be regarded as an act unfriendly to the United States. These resolutions intended to buy more time for the Congress's aspiration of acquiring the Hawaiian Islands for military purposes. Adding to the political firestorm that President Cleveland had to contend with were hearings called for by Senator Morgan of Alabama as chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. These Senate hearings sought to circumvent the requirement of international law where a crime committed by the envoy or diplomat on the territory of the receiving state must be punished by his home state. Morgan's purpose was to vindicate the illegal conduct and actions of the U.S. diplomat John Stevens and Captain Wilts of the USS Boston. Four Republicans endorsed the report with Morgan but four Democrats submitted a minority report declaring that while they agree in exonerating the commander of the USS Boston, Captain Wilts, they could not concur in exonerating Mr. Stevens from active, officious, and unbecoming participation in the events which led to the revolution in the Sandwich Islands on the 14th, 16th, and 17th of January, 1893. Cleveland's failure to fulfill his obligation of the agreement allowed the provisional government to gain strength 
and hire mercenaries for their protection. And on July 4th, 1894, the insurgents renamed themselves the Republic of Hawaii. Without a pardon from the Queen, the insurgents continued to remain fugitives of Hawaiian law no matter what they called themselves. On January 16, 1895, the insurgents take a bold step and the Queen and other loyal subjects are arrested for treason. The Queen was arrested on a so-called charge of misprision of treason or knowledge of treason. The irony of this situation is that these criminals committed treason in the first place, which was the basis of the executive agreements and for the Queen to grant amnesty after the government was restored. But they are now projecting themselves as if they are a real government. The Queen was tried and convicted by a kangaroo court with sham legal proceedings. They claimed she abdicated the throne. The insurgents had no lawful authority, being criminals themselves, but their intent was to humiliate the Queen. In fact, Sanford Dole, leader of the insurgents and former Associate Justice on the Hawaiian Kingdom Supreme Court, admitted to the other insurgents in a so-called cabinet meeting two days before the arrest that there was no evidence of the complicity of the Queen to cause her apprehension. Two years passed before Cleveland's presidential successor, Willie McKinley, prepared to meet with the insurgents in a second attempt to acquire the Hawaiian Islands by a treaty of session. The first attempt to annex by treaty was signed between President Harrison and the insurgents on February 14, 1893, but the treaty was removed from the Senate by President Cleveland and superseded by executive agreements. The second attempt to annex by treaty was signed on June 16, 1897 in Washington, but wouldn't be submitted to the U.S. Senate for ratification until December when the Congress would reconvene. By definition, the term seat or session is to yield or grant, typically by treaty. So session is an act that takes place between two countries by treaty, which is a bilateral agreement whereby territory and sovereignty would be transferred. Sessions can take place either voluntary or involuntary, which is by conquest. Here are some examples of sessions that took place between the United States and other foreign states. Voluntary sessions include the Louisiana Purchase from France in 1803, the Florida Purchase from Spain in 1819, the Pacific Northwest Purchase from the British in 1846, and the Alaskan Purchase from the Russians in 1867. Involuntary sessions include the 1848 Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo that ended the Mexican-American War ceding all former Mexican territory north of the Rio Grande River, and the 1898 Treaty of Paris that ended the Spanish-American War ceding the former Spanish territories of Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippines. When the second treaty was signed with the insurgents, Queen Liliuokalani was in Washington and filed a diplomatic protest with the State Department on June 18, 1897. In her opening statement of the protest, the Queen stated, I, Liliuokalani of Hawaii, by the will of God, named heir apparent on the 10th day of April, 1877, and by the grace of God, Queen of the Hawaiian Islands, on the 17th day of January, 1893, do hereby protest against the ratification of a certain treaty, which, so I am informed, has been signed at Washington by Monsignors Hatch, Thurston, and Keeney, purporting to cede those islands to the territory and dominion of the United States. I declare such a treaty to be an act of wrong toward the native and part native people of Hawaii, an invasion of the rights of the ruling chiefs, in violation of international rights both toward my people and toward friendly nations with whom they have made treaties, the perpetuation of the fraud whereby the constitutional government was overthrown, and finally an act of gross injustice to me. Hawaiian political organizations representing Hawaiian nationals and loyal resident aliens in the islands also filed protests with the Department of State in Washington. In spite of these protests, 
President McKinley was determined to get ratification from the Senate. But the Senate wouldn't convene until December. This prompted the mobilization of two Hawaiian political organizations in the islands to gather signature petitions, protesting annexation, and to file these protests with the Senate when it reconvenes in December. One of the organizations was the Hawaiian Patriotic League, or Hui Aloha Aina, and the other organization was the Hawaiian Political Association, or the Hui Kalai Aina. The founding president of the Patriotic League was Joseph Navahi, an attorney and former legislator for 20 years from the city of Hilo, as well as former Minister of Foreign Affairs under the Queen. He was such a threat to the insurgency that they arrested him on fabricated charges, and while in prison he contracted tuberculosis. He later died in California and was succeeded by James Kaulia, another attorney and former legislator. And the Women's Association of the Patriotic League was headed by Mrs. Kua Helani Campbell. And the widow of Mr. Navahi served as secretary, Mrs. Aiman Navahi. The Patriotic League gathered 21,269 signatures. And the political association gathered nearly 17,000 signatures. But because of concern over the wording of the politi political association's preamble, which was thought to be more pro-monarchy, it was decided by these organizations that only the Patriotic League's petition would be submitted to the Senate because it protested annexation in any way, shape, or form. After meeting with members of the Patriotic Societies in Washington, Senator Hoare of Massachusetts agreed to introduce the signature petition to the Senate when it convened in December. These protests from the Queen and Hawaiian subjects successfully prevented the Senate from ratifying the so-called Treaty of Session, and by March of 1898, the treaty was dead. Thus ended the second attempt to acquire Hawaii by a Treaty of Session. Hawaii still remaining an independent and sovereign state, and the 1893 executive agreements remain binding agreements upon the president and his successors in office for their faithful execution. For more information on the federal lawsuit, Psy versus Obama et al., visit www.hawaiankingdom.org.